Um, find a seat, and most people have already. Um, and feel free to help yourselves some more pizza. It looks like there's still quite a bit. Um, on behalf of the Ralph Bunch Society and Praxis, the Fletcher Journal of Human Security, I'm very excited to welcome you here today. Um, the Ralph Bunch Society is a student organization dedicated to promoting the work of people of color in international affairs. While Praxis is Fletcher's leading and only um, journal of human security, um, we are, just to give one brief plug, we are now um, soliciting calls, um, articles for our academic journal. Um, so I invite you to go to Fletcher.com slash Praxis to read more about what we're looking for in an article and to submit one for review. Um, but without um, much more than that, I would like to um, introduce Philip Martin, um, which is the reason, the man who is the reason we're all here today. Um, Philip Martin is an alum of the Fletcher School. He received his master's here. Um, and he's currently a, a senior investigative reporter for WGBH, um, which is a radio station based in Boston. He has covered a variety of topics and most recently has covered um, the human trafficking um, trade between Southeast Asia and Boston, which he'll be discussing today. His coverage of this issue won the UN Gold Award for Excellence in Programming. Um, so I'll just give you um, a few more details about his background, his very impressive background. Um, what had originally inspired the Ralph Bunch Society and Praxis to bring him to campus today is his work with Lifted Veils Production, where he is executive producer and does the Color Initiative, which is an occasional series of reports about the global impact of skin color that airs on the world, a co-production that he helped create. He's also an adjunct professor at Brandeis University and has held numerous fellowships, such as a senior fellowship with the Schuster Institute for Investigative Journalism. Um, in addition to his master's degree from Fletcher, he has studied the international protection of human rights at the Harvard Law School and studied journalism at UC Berkeley um, in their program for minority journalists. So without further ado, I would like to welcome him up here. Thank to, you, Karen. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I can tell you right now how long it's been since I've been to Fletcher because uh, I got lost, you know, all these new impressive buildings. Uh, there used to be one entrance and uh, now they're about four or five. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, the human trafficking, uh, let me just say a few uh, words before we start this presentation. Uh, I was at an uh, extraordinary presentation on Thursday um, the, uh, at the Fa at Fanyo Hall, uh, where the main speaker was a fellow named uh, Siddharth Kara, who talks about the, gro the growth, actually, of uh, human trafficking. I mean, that's the bad news. The good news is there's, uh, we're actually putting a dent in human trafficking as a result of people like Siddharth Kara uh, and others who are basically working in various parts of the world to counter human trafficking, which is a very lucrative, uh, a very lucrative crime uh, for those engaged in it, and I'd like to talk about one aspect of it. I'd like to talk about one of the um, trafficking trails, if you will, uh, that uh, several trafficking trails actually, but one in particular, which is uh, from New York uh, to uh, to Boston and New England, and from New York and across the entire um, uh, Eastern Seaboard. And the provenance of that trail, uh, oftentimes, uh, there are several, but one is certainly from Southeast Asia and from Southern China. So that's the core of this, uh, of this presentation. Does anyone here work in um, the human trafficking uh, field? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just curious. Uh, does anyone work actively or has worked? Okay. Uh, what, what do you do, ma'am? Um, in the past, I worked with the Mass Task Force for Human Trafficking. Right, I, very good. Yeah, I've, I've done quite a few interviews with them. Yeah, they were present, in fact, at the, at the lecture on, um, some of their members were present at the lecture on, on Thursday. Let's start, um, let's start this way. We, we call this underground trade because that's, uh, I, I'm sure you can hear my voice, but uh, just in case, so. we're all, I, I'm, uh, okay, good, small room. Uh, we call this underground trade because that's precisely what 
this is. This is part of the underground economy. It's part of what's fueling. Um, it's part of what's fueling other crimes in the world as well. These things are almost always concomitant uh, with other crimes. Under uh, human trafficking, almost always involves some other crime: money laundering, gun running, drug smuggling, something of that sort. There's almost always a connection. It's simply not. Uh, does not exist in a vacuum. We again call this uh, WGBH and uh, Public Radio International, the world, uh, we call this the underground trade. But before we can start talking about, um, before I can talk about human trafficking as it exists now, I have to talk about what has always existed for many years, that is to say slavery, in one incarnation or, or another. Uh, the 13th Amendment, of course, abolished slavery institutionally in this country, but not in practice. Uh, the, as, you, uh, as you know, historically, after, um, after 1865, slavery continued in various forms throughout the South and in other forms uh, uh, in the West, uh, in terms of indentured uh, servants, in terms of sharecropping, so on and so forth. We ask this question, is, is human trafficking actually modern day slavery? I ask that because the term human trafficking in many ways is rhetorical in the sense that like a lot of terms, it may be overused. Uh, so it, it merits careful examination. And when we talk about human trafficking, we also have to look at it in, a context, in the context of the United Nations of uh, United Nations declarations, United Nations statutes, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, so on and so forth. And when, when I'm talking about human, right, uh, human trafficking and when others refer to it, we are talking about it in both a legal context uh, and in terms of its, its impact. If some woman de declares, as my sister did many years ago, um, and this is one of the reasons I'm in this field. Uh, she disappeared many years ago, uh, and we were able to, if you will, rescue her. But th there was no term at that time about uh, such as human trafficking. Uh, what she endured uh, was, we simply referred to it as a, a horrible kidnapping. Uh, but it was, what we later found out, of course, in the context of uh, what occurred, that she was in fact a victim of human trafficking. And what that definition of means is it comes down to slavery. Coerced work, including pr uh, the provision of sex, sex trafficking is what most people focus on, but of course it's much more. Uh, children forced into marriage, debt bondage, including uh, folks, you know, like actually being kidnapped off the uh, Sea of Thailand and forced, on, uh, dragooned onto ships. Uh, we've seen that happen to, uh, uh, in Asia, we've seen that happen in the Caribbean, has, hap has happened in, uh, off the coast of Somalia. Uh, all those pirates aren't volunteers. Uh, it's happened uh, uh, many places in the world. There's hereditary enslavement, as we see in the context of the new Global uh, Slavery Index, uh, which uh, lists Mauritania as the number one country in terms of population uh, that engages in slavery. About 4% of the people in Mauritania are born into slavery. About 4%, huge number. But the largest number of people impacted by, by slavery, debt bondage in this case, are folks in South Asia. Uh, men, women, and children in India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, the, are, are the primary victims of, um, of um, debt bondage. And that is something we could talk about toward the, uh, toward the end of this presentation. Let's go back for a second to 18... 65 in the abolition of slavery. This, there was a particular um, institution in place in the South starting in 1890, and this was based on something called the Penal Codes. Uh, there are lots of names for it, but what it essentially meant that as a black individual usually a male, but sometimes females. If you were caught walking around at night, you could be taken off the street and be charged with, uh, with um, vagrancy. You could be charged with, there were charges such as selling cotton illegally. 
You could be charged with uh, whistling at someone, a white woman. And this would end up, the, in, in 1890, when the South was trying to reclaim its, uh, its economy, ruined, of course, by the Civil War, ruined by, uh, some would argue, by the institution of slavery, gone away. They, the South heavily depended economically on slavery. And so there was this question of how do we basically recoup our, the, the wealth of the South? Well, the, the main engine of the South was forced labor. And so what happened in, um, in 1890 and all the way up to 1952 in this country, uh, in the United States of America, is a little known um, aspect of our history. Uh, when I say our, I know everyone's not from the United States, so forgive me. With the, uh, with the pronoun. But uh, the, the point is that uh, in the context of American history, a lot of folks were basically picked up off the street, uh, accused of any crime whatsoever. Sometimes it was a real crime, sometimes it was no crime. But the point is, if you could not pay the, uh, the fine, you were sent to prison. And being sent to prison essentially meant that you were working for plantation owners in the South, working for mining uh, operations in the South, working for tobacco operations in the South, working for all types of operations in order for the South to recoup that wealth which it lost uh, by the um, failure of slavery. So one example of enslavement in the U.S. from 1865 to 1952 um, were, was the penal codes largely uh, present in the South. Oops, I'm sorry. We need volume. My apologies. Let's see that order. There's actually something playing here in the background. And anyone know how this? Uh, I think I need to take this part off. I forgot about the volume. I thought not, well, actually, you don't need that part. We just, I think there's a volume control here, right? Sorry. Oh, no, that's my bad. Okay. Okay. To labor against their will. From almost the Sorry, first the moment, moment, white Southerners were responding to try to put African Americans back into a position as close to slavery as they possibly could. We're gonna try that again. Mr. President, I have a brother about 14 years old. A man hired him for me and I heard of him no more. He went and sold him to McGree and they has been working him in prison for 12 months. I asked him to let me have him, but he, he won't let him go. For a period of nearly 80 years, between the Civil War and World War II, black Southerners were no longer slaves, but they were not yet free. In one of the most shameful and little-known chapters of American history, generations of black Southerners were forced to labor against their will. From almost the first moment, white Southerners were responding to try to put African Americans back into a position as close to slavery as they possibly could. Here in the United States, for instance, in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement, there was a perception that the, the problem of peonage, the problem of slavery, of sharecropping, was a thing of the past. And quietly, the abusers were bringing in immigrants to replace the African-American community. That was uh, uh, Ambassador Zemecka, uh, who is the United Nations, I mean, I'm sorry, the United States uh, Ambassador on Human Trafficking. Yes, the United States actually has an ambassador on human trafficking, appointed by Hillary Clinton uh, in this administration, but it, it's actually a continuation of the Bush administration policy of focusing on human trafficking. It's become an important issue 
in, in the context of U.S. Uh, human rights policy. And Mr. Sebeka here, Ambassador Sebeka here, was describing the fact that after 1952 or so, large numbers of immigrants were coming in, uh, increasingly, I should say, from Latin America, uh, Guatemalans, uh, but mainly uh, Mexicans uh, coming in to uh, pick crops in California, uh, Jamaicans coming into uh, Florida, uh, and and here in the north uh, to Maine, to to uh, Massachusetts, to Vermont to pick apples. And there was a lot of abuse occurring during that period. A lot of that abuse amounted to uh, de facto <coughs> slavery. And thus the State Department actually, many years ago actually, even before an, an official was actually appointed as an ambassador, uh, and, the, and, I, and also the Justice Department was looking at incidents, acts of slavery in the United States. The difference, of course, is this was not institutionalized. This was against the law. This was unconstitutional. It contravened, you know, like United States laws and so on and so forth. But the reason people get away with this stuff today, the reason they got away with it, got away with it at that time, is the laws weren't always deep and effective enough. And we're and thus, uh, as we continue to attack the problem of human trafficking, laws, both international law and local law, domestic law, has to be strengthened. Uh, it, and in many cases, it has been strengthened. There's also public diplomacy. The United States, year after year, uh, of course, releases a report. Uh, you've probably seen it, a TIP report, looking at trafficking in persons reports around the world. Which countries are our are greatest violators, which are least divided to various categories, one, two, three, uh, so on and so forth. And this brings us to... I do believe that that is entirely connected. You know, the people you traffic as forced labor, they expect you to service their employers as sex slaves. I got lucky because this woman did not have a husband there. Had there been a husband, I would have been subjected to slavery. This is a woman named Beatrice Fernando, who uh, was uh, basically imprisoned, essentially imprisoned in a home in Lebanon. She's from Sri Lanka. As you know, many guest workers uh, come from South Asia, the Philippines, other countries, end up in uh, well, we end up in places around, the, around the, the globe, including here in the United States. The United States is not immune to this. She was speaking about uh, a debt that she had to basically um, fulfill uh, in Lebanon and said that and there's, there's a very close connection between labor and sex trafficking. It all obviously depends on the circumstances. If a woman is put into a situation where uh, there are large numbers of men she ends up doing, you know, many things besides, you know, like uh, uh, cultivating a field or braiding hair, uh, as we will talk about. The U.S. ranked 162 of 161 countries around the world where verifiable human trafficking is taking place. But it hardly suggests that uh, tr human trafficking is not taking place uh, in the United States. This is the new Global Slavery Index uh, that was just released by First Global Slavery Index released by the Walk Free Foundation out of the UK. It's the first time ever that such an index has been, um, been released. And it's, a, again, one of the devices being used by anti-traffickers around the world to try to put this problem in check. Ooh, look at surprise. You, you wouldn't think you'd see that, like, in Wellesley. You know? And right there under our noses. Yeah, I'm a bike rider, right? you know, all that stuff that goes on, and I didn't even know. When people think of human trafficking, they expect um, that there are, you know, people being held behind walls, you know, locked doors. That's not always the case. And to think that they would do that to the girls, you know what I mean? Never let them out. You know, they could never pay enough. We allege that there are women who are being offered for sale. We, we don't believe that they live in Massachusetts. We believe they, uh, and we allege they've been transported from, at least as far as we know, from out of state. We have reason to believe in some instances that uh, if they've come from New York or some other state, that's not where they came from. That last voice is the uh, Massachusetts Attorney General Martha <coughs> Coakley talking about uh, several uh, investigations into human trafficking in Massachusetts. 
that takes place this way, uh, where individuals have been brought in from out of state. It's believed they're coming in from New York. Uh, many of those individuals have come in from Flushing, Queens. Uh, why, you'll see as we proceed with the presentation. Uh, and that they end up in any variety of, of uh, venues, situations. Massage parlors have been, the, uh, have been proliferating in Massachusetts, but around the country actually. Massage parlors have been mis proliferating because it's easy to get a, uh, a license. That's something we'll also talk about. But there are other also areas where individuals, largely women, but sometimes men, have ended up uh, in a position of being prostituted. The uh, so-called sex trade, as you may know, it no longer lives in designated red light districts. We used to have something here called the combat zone, where uh, where you basically where it start was called the combat zone because in the early 60s, uh, servicemen would largely would mainly go down to downtown Boston in the area around Chinatown uh, and the Boston um, uh, the Boston Common and seek prostitutes there. There were also script clubs there, gentlemen clubs there, so-called. Um, and that became a, a point of, um, of acceptance in terms of, the, in terms of Boston's, uh, uh, the way Boston saw things, the way we saw the relationship, the relationship between men and women, in fact. Boys will be boys, this is something guys have to do, so on and so forth. It was expected. Uh, now, as more and more awareness of, there's more and more awareness of the link between human trafficking, human rights violations, and being prostituted. Uh, if you notice, I'm, that's the term I'm using because it's more applicable to most of the situations that occur around the world in terms of the relationship between um, men and women and the issue of sex uh, for, for pay. The so-called sex trade no longer lives in designated red light districts. Uh, today, prostitution occurs um, as it did before in brothels, but also apartments, uh, nail salons, hotels, all highlighted for uh, interested parties in online ads and alternative newspapers. And where there's prostitution, most experts say uh, there is human trafficking. The massage parlor ring operating in Wellesley, Mass, off Route 9, it was discovered, was indeed the tip of an of the iceberg because this particular organized crime, and it was organized crime, uh, set up was connected to five other spas, body works places, <coughs> all types of names for it, throughout the, uh, in Massachusetts and in uh, southern New Hampshire. The uh, investigators are now following one of many trails and this particular st path starts in East Asia uh, lands in New York before heading up the East Coast of Providence, here in Boston, and other communities along the Northeast Corridor. This was the essence of my investigation uh, into human trafficking and the reason we have uh, titled this uh, uh, from Boston uh, to, to Bangkok, or reverse it if you will, Bangkok to Boston. Uh, Bangkok only of course being um, symbolic of the larger issue of trafficking uh, in, in the world. Trafficking occurs everywhere. And it's not just women coming in from Asia. Uh, we could have easily focused in on Estonia. We could have easily focused in on, um, on, the, on the Ukraine, on parts of uh, Eastern Europe where it is proliferating, large swaths of Africa uh, where women have been um, uh, basically uh, kidnapped uh, under some circumstances, sometimes brought into a country under false pretenses, promise the job, that type of thing, uh, oftentimes owing a debt. So this could occur anywhere. Uh, we're looking at um, the connection between Boston and Asia largely because there was data uh, on, this, on this particular enterprise. A uh, white van pulled up. The women who were working in the nail salon were all escorted out onto the van with, by you know, an older woman that was working in the nail salon and two men who were already in the van. And they were loaded into the van, doors were closed. I was curious about that. And, and, I don't know, my God, I guess. The van drove to Quincy and the two men get out, open the side doors, the women stepped out, all had changed their clothes. 
into either very short skirts and tight shirts or uh, very short, short shorts. And they went into a place in Quincy and um, it turned out to be a massage parlor. And that massage parlor turned out to be connected again to organized crime. Uh, the person you just heard, that's the voice of a uh, former cop named Paul Taylor uh, turned um, uh, investigator into human trafficking. He worked for a bureau here in Massachusetts called the Division of Licensure. The Division of Licensure became a very important uh, partner in, term, in working with the Attorney General's office because they are the division that issues licenses to nail salons, to beauty parlors, uh, to barber shops, so on and so forth. And most of these places are totally legit. Totally. Uh, the problem is that human traffickers, like criminals of all ilk, look for opportunity. And what they found was that it was fairly easy to get a license for uh, a nail salon. Fairly easy, relatively easy to get a license for a massage parlor. And what you do is you turn those uh, licenses into several things. Money laundering is one. Cheap labor uh, or unpaid labor in some circumstances another. Uh, oftentimes Vietnamese women, first generation, arriving here owing a debt. But it also involves you know, Russians, uh, Russian women, also involves uh, Ukrainians, also involves Koreans. Uh, large numbers of people are involved. We had we, in, we interviewed a fellow in Dorchester, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I don't know how many of you have actually got a chance to really explore the area. But uh, I'm going to mention a few neighborhoods that you might not be familiar with, and then we'll connect it again to the larger international issue. But Dorchester is a large Vietnamese community, a vibrant community, a very strong uh, community. Uh, I've spoken with many uh, individuals out there, know some of them. Uh, uh, individuals there have known them for many years and they've been basically looked at for when I first looked into this there was a lot of denial that there was any connection whatsoever to human trafficking within those communities and that's because of a larger issue that we'll talk about later in this in this uh, in this presentation which is which is shame but but increasingly they're finding that individuals largely women are being exploited by other individuals we know them as pimps uh, but uh, increasingly they're being recognized as not just pimps, but these are facilitators. Uh, they, uh, they do more than just uh, uh, beat uh, and, uh, and push women into, uh, into a life of, of crime. They also work uh, into a life of uh, solicitation, rather. They also work to enrich themselves, and they're again connected to other crimes uh, that we'll talk about here. Um, this, um, I mentioned here various examples where, uh, where these individuals, pimps and uh, human traffickers, see opportunity. Uh, for, in places like New Jersey, uh, they have been using hair braiding salons uh, <coughs> populated by Ghanaian women, um, other African women, to, uh, and have basically used that as a way of uh, money laundering and setting these women up for, uh, to work. Uh, as prostitutes. They are being prostituted. Restaurants uh, where you see of, of people being dragooned into working for nothing uh, to pay off debt. Body works, uh, beauty parlors, tanning salons, gentlemen's clubs, strip clubs. Wherever there's an opportunity, uh, you will find, as um, Arlen Vanderbilt, a detective in San Francisco, told me, whenever you, they find an opportunity, they will try to use it because they're trying to stay one step ahead of uh, both law enforcement and anti-traffickers. That is to say, people in, engaged in NGOs who are uh, involved in tracking down some of these individuals when they feel the police are not doing a good job. And that's happening increasingly or, uh, around, around the world. I'll talk about a group uh, in a few minutes that I think has done a particularly good job out of Vietnam, a group called uh, Blue Dragon. Pimps can use the internet. They're recruiting girls from the internet. They are setting these girls up with websites, making them think, you know, that you know, let's put some makeup on you, some nice clothes, take these professional pictures. And the reason we don't see our children is because they're all on the internet. You have to go on Craigslist and all those places. And what they do now is just place the girls in a hotel room instead of where I come from on a street corner. I had a girl say to me, that was her, her term, because of the internet, 
like today, she can say, next week, um, I'll be in New York, and then Johns will schedule appointments with her. And uh, that's the other aspect. There's, of course, there's trafficking in plain sight. That is to say, um, massage parlors, so on and so forth. But a large, a large percentage of human trafficking occurs out of sight, largely because of the facilitation of the internet. Uh, the uh, and and that takes place in various forms. There there are ads on, on Craigslist. There's a, something called Backpage.com, uh, which uh, theoretically at least is cooperating with uh, with law enforcement to uh, to try track down traffickers. But they make a lot of money through these ads, and so that's why I say theoretical, uh, because it doesn't always manifest into action on the part of of uh, the publishers of these of these websites. More uh, serious and, and more frightening to, um, uh, to parents who've lost their children, more frightening to uh, individuals who, cannot, who no longer know where uh, their, uh, their children might be. It's something called the dark net. Um, my next series, uh, working, I've basically been, have been interviewing people at Microsoft and Google about this ultra-encrypted uh, dark net where individuals basically traffic uh, and without uh, the type of scrutiny, obviously, that would be found uh, in a massage parlor or uh, in a hotel and so on and so forth. As I said, the guys uh, who and women who engage in human trafficking oftentimes are one step ahead of uh, the police, ahead of Interpol often. Uh, and so a lot of these organizations working with computer um, firms like Microsoft, which has an entire division uh, working on cybercrime, including human trafficking, um, they, uh, is engaged in right now. The woman you just heard is Audrey Porter, who helps run a group called My Life, My Choice, where they have basically worked with um, prostituted girls, uh, the average age that pro prostitution begins for, for most girls and many boys in this country. Uh, is at the age of 11. Uh, and as you probably heard this rhetorically, uh, but it really makes sense. I don't think any 11 year old wakes up and says, I want to be a prostitute. I don't think that happens. But uh, it becomes a way of life because of any number of, uh, of circumstances. The vicissitudes of poverty, for example. Uh, and poverty is, is one of the principal factors that fuels uh, uh, individuals being funneled, being pushed into, uh, into a life of human, I mean being human trafficked, I should say, being trafficked. Um, how, how many folks uh, drive down to New York uh, fairly regularly? Okay, well if you've driven to New York, you've taken the same routes as, uh, as many human traffickers. Uh, they uh, basically use the the same highways. We have had cases where women were brought down from New York into Boston, stayed for a couple of weeks, and then were moved to other areas. There are actually vans that pick up women from Flushing every morning and take them out to Long Island. And even in speaking with a partner we have in the Boston area, uh, she, she told me recently that, yeah, a number of the women that they get are actually from New York City. After I got to New York, I wanted to find a job, so people told me, read the newspaper and then you'll find a job. So I responded to an ad in the newspaper and got a job in a massage parlor. At the time, I thought it was just massages, and I didn't think anything of it. And the boss basically told me I needed to give them my passport so I wouldn't run away with their money. From China, southern China, to New York, expecting a job. This happens all the time. This is paradigmatic of uh, what happens in, uh, to a lot of victims. Uh, and arrived in New York expecting a job, uh, took the job that was given to her, in this case working in a massage parlor. Working in a massage parlor meant being prostituted. Uh, this a, a particular woman, uh, whose identity we obviously will not reveal and do not reveal, uh, it was shown was was basically uh, she was basically a part of 
made part of an organized criminal gang working out of, out of Flushing. And she was uh, rescued, if you will, uh, and again, I put this in quotation marks because uh, the, the police are only be now becoming sensitive to prostituted women. Uh, when I say the police, I mean across the country. Uh, the, the role that, uh, that uh, the, the, the difference between a prostitute and being prostituted is something that's only, again, coming to the attention of law enforcement because of any number of things, including human trafficking laws that are being uh, set up in various states around the country. I think there are only two now that do not have a human trafficking law. Anyway, she was arrested when Baltimore police raided a massage parlor uh, she was working with. It didn't take long for the police to realize that this was a case of human, tra tra human trafficking. And today she's living in a safe house with help from the New York Asian Women's Center. <clears throat> the business of trafficking. Uh, one of the things we tried to point out in the series of human trafficking, uh, underground, the underground trade, is that uh, there's a connection between sex tourism and human trafficking. Why? Well, it's quite simple. Uh, because of supply and demand. Uh, and so that's why in many cases, it's not to, it's not the same when it flies to Thailand. Uh, it's going to Thailand uh, for uh, uh, to engage in, in sex. But it's, it's a huge attraction, obviously, and uh, that's why uh, many men indeed fly uh, 8,500 miles and spend $4,000 uh, over the course of two weeks in a place like Pattaya, Thailand. Relationships here are always so complicated, but over there, they're told and they're trained to serve. So it's also that, that power that the man has, that he feels like he's a king. And they go there and it's just pure sex. It's uncut. His name is Jim. It's not his real name, uh, but that's what we, we, uh, we called him. And he uh, explained that, uh, why he was willing to spend that kind of money uh, without at least initially connecting this to the issue of human trafficking because at least the, the, the appearance of consent. And consent is in, get involved in, in, uh, to some degree. But, Fran Gao helps lead the New York Asian Women's Center. It has saved hundreds of women forced into a life of sex or labor servitude. In recent years, the statistics, at least in the US, show a lot of the victims of sex trafficking are in fact Asian. If you wanted to say it's because Asian women are desirable, that's why there was a demand, that's why traffickers go out and recruit and get a lot of Asian women to fill the demands of U.S. men. I met one of these men in New York City. When I was over there in Southeast Asia, the women were tremendous. Never a problem. And a lot of this started with uh, this, the establishment of, at least in Asia, the establishment of U.S. military bases. U.S. military bases in Vietnam, in Korea, in Japan, basically, uh, as we saw with the comfort women in Japan, uh, I mean in Korea, and uh, in uh, the Philippines, and other places during World War II. Well, these uh, were, the comfort women were basically victims, direct victims, that explicitly uh, uh, kidnapped, forced into a life of prostitution, uh, the, the American servicemen saw the situation around their bases as one representing volunteers. Well, that's not the case, of course, if in fact you have power. Uh, and power, of course, comes through the dollar. It came through bucks. It came through the fact that you, are, you have money and other individuals don't. There are coercive factors that drive people into prostitution. And what we found in research in nine countries on five continents is that the factors that drive women and some men, children, into prostitution are the ancient social harms of sexism, racism, and poverty. Melissa Farley, a researcher in California, has basically been looking into the issue of consent uh, and, as, and the issue of volunteerism, so on and so forth, thanks to them. And I'm going to move this along 
further. Uh, but she is important in trying to understand uh, the, uh, again, the factors that uh, drive uh, human trafficking and the appearance of consent oftentimes. We looked at, again, Patia as just one of those uh, places, but there are many places around the country, I mean around the world. The Dominican Republic uh, increasingly has become a source. Uh, parts of Brazil, it's an entire uh, section of Recife that's called Germantown, named for the fact that German men uh, have spent a lot of time in that, in that area for uh, reasons of soliciting young, young, young prostituted girls. About 45 minutes outside of Pati, past shanties and roadside stalls selling mangoes, I arrive at the Anti-Trafficking and Child Abuse Center. A 12-year-old boy sitting under a tree says American men have come to this town and asked for him by name. By, um, uh, they asked me to go with them to do sex. And I do it for some people. That was in uh, outside of Patio. That's again one aspect of, uh, of, uh, of trafficking, which is ch uh, child trafficking. Another aspect of this series was uh, along the China Vietnamese uh, China Vietnam border where young uh, women, in some cases boys, but mainly women, have basically been taken across the border into China. A lot of this, I won't go into the details, but a lot of this uh, uh, researchers feel, the United Nations uh, Anti-Trafficking Division believes it has a lot to do with the disparity between uh, uh, populations of boys and, and girls and the imbalance that's occurred because of, of China's uh, one-child policy. Again, that's, part, that's, that's debatable, but it's one of the issues that's, that's pushed. And so there's been a lot of uh, kidnapping of young women into China, uh, sometimes young Chinese women into Thailand. I mean, it happens on the reverse, too. And it's not just Vietnamese women, it's sometimes Laotian uh, uh, and others. But this has been a huge issue uh, highlighted by groups uh, like Oxfam uh, Australia uh, and Oxfam UK. Uh, the uh, let's see, we are running out of time quickly. Okay, this goes fast. <laughs> Vietnam is losing its children for years. Girls and young women have been taken, kidnapped, and trafficked across the border into Cambodia and southern China. Many disappear into big cities. Some give birth, their babies held by traffickers as insurance that these enslaved girls and women won't run away. For some, a tiny number, find freedom when they escape or are rescued. And that's what this story is all about. She was uh, locked up and in um, Guangdong province in China. And uh, one night, I came back uh, from the US. The police, Chinese police rang me and asked for my help to rescue this girl. And we don't know why and who trafficked her to China yet. About 600 kilometers from... Um, that last voice um, of, it's, it's a young man of, who it worked for a group called Blue Dragon. Australian group set up in, uh, in Vietnam that has been responsible for rescuing about 700 uh, children, uh, not just uh, in the, uh, in, who've been kidnapped across uh, into the China, uh, into China, southern China, but also Viet in Vietnam itself, uh, kids who've been basically taken to, to Saigon, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, and in, uh, and in Saigon, uh, they have basically been placed into uh, factories, what they call factories, garbage factories. Uh, I drove around some of these factories late at night at 2 in the morning. You could see just a little light shining in uh, through a little grate, and you see children uh, sewing clothes at 2 or 3 in the morning. Um, and Blue Dragon has been responsible for rescuing many of these kids, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, um, as was a taxi driver, a very courageous man who I met in... Uh, uh, in Saigon, a taxi driver who basically uh, would, would drive around picking these kids up and taking them home uh, no matter how far it was in the, in the country. Uh, this was, and this is what gives me hope 
about uh, combating this, uh, this, this scourge, this crime. Related to Vietnam, the Vietnamese community, of, uh, community center uh, in Dorchester has basically been in touch with Vietnamese leaders in, in Vietnam who are working and fighting human trafficking. Learning from, from them and they, learning, uh, they are also learning from Dorchester right here about the, the various things both communities are doing to, uh, to fight uh, human trafficking. When I transferred Hong Kong to Thailand, they gave me a fake passport. There will be recruiters on the buses who look for young, vulnerable kids and say, you know, you should work at this massage parlor. And so I know that the recruiters do work on those routes. It is literally millions of women, men, and children being coerced against their will to provide labor or services in any number of sectors, uh, from agriculture to construction to mining to garment factories, often in very subhuman conditions with severe restrictions on their liberty, so they can't get away. There is no country, no region, no city that is immune to human trafficking. And we'll leave it at that. The, uh... Trafficking uh, is an economic crime. This is what fuels it. Uh, it's estimated that uh, in 2010, it was estimated at $40 billion. Uh, now it's estimated at $30 billion. It depends on whose uh, uh, who's, uh, figures you're looking at. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the figures are all over the place. Uh, that is my main concern about coverage of this issue. Uh, another concern I have is that in many ways, it's become the issue du jour. Uh, there's an examination of human trafficking, but there's not always an examination of, uh, it's not, it's, sometimes it's only skin deep. And so what I would hope that all of us would do is uh, to basically explore this in terms of its greater impact on society. In other words, how we're benefiting from human trafficking. It's not just a question of victimhood and victimization, it's a question of how societies basically advantage uh, themselves at the expense of trafficked victims and survivors. Uh, so if you have any questions whatsoever, we have about two minutes to, or three minutes to uh, entertain those, please. My friend. Owen oh, Arfatia, a military fellow here at the Fletcher School. And you talked about a lot of those things around military bases. Yes. Right now, before we deploy anywhere in the world, even to Iraq or, or Afghanistan, human trafficking is one of the required classes that every American soldier goes through to recognize what a human trafficked person looks like and who we're reported to and all the all the steps that we're supposed to do to help police some of this up. So a lot of that did occur, I'm sure, but historically there's there's been a big change in the modern time. You're absolutely right. But and I would also it, it and it has been a big change. A lot of that is because of the awareness of human human trafficking. We had not long ago, if you remember, the incident uh, down in um, uh, oh my god, I'm forgetting where it was. Uh, Remember the young, the young prostituted women in uh, was it? South huh? South America. It was it was the somewhere CIA in South America. I forget where it was. Well, it was about uh, two years ago. When the question came up, were those in, were those individuals uh, uh, victims of human trafficking? We say victims, by the way, uh, when we're referring to young women, particularly. It doesn't matter if they said I'm, if they're 18, if they said, well, hey, look, maybe I would like to do this. Maybe this is my way of bringing in money. But the, the legal definition of, uh, of, of, of human, a human trafficked victim uh, is someone, for those who are underage, is they have no consent whatsoever under the age of 16 in most countries, 17 in some countries, 18 in this country. Uh, there's a, but in terms of your point, you're absolutely right. There has been a wholesale difference in terms of the way the U.S. military approaches this issue largely. Uh, because of awareness of, of human trafficking problems. Uh, please. And then. Uh, if somebody else had a comment, it's fine. Uh -huh. please. Uh, I was uh -huh. going to ask, um, you talked about how uh, human trafficking happens kind of at the same time as other illegal trafficking activities and organized right. crime. Is there coordination or opportunities for coordination between anti-human trafficking organizations and activities and this other law enforcement? Yeah, there is. Uh, Kevin Bells, who you, who you may have heard of, uh, who um, is a prominent anti-trafficker uh, and an academician. He basically has encouraged and uh, uh, when law enforcement, when they're looking into these uh, 
uh, into operations, human trafficking operations, to also look at concomitant of, of factors, uh, gun running, uh, drug, uh, drug relationships, so on and so forth. And some, um, some groups like Oxfam UK do in fact work with, um, uh, work with police uh, on, under some circumstances, not too closely with police, because in some countries that doesn't work too well, does it? Uh, but work, they work with, uh, with uh, police forces and work with um, uh, the Walk Free Foundation to basically uh, look at the, to see how those things are, um, if indeed they are uh, crossing paths. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, please, any, anyone else? Well, I guess in your work, have you come across any sort of approaches or organizations that have good techniques or models for Uh, yeah, well, that's a good question. But save the uh, it's, it's it's Bell's group called Save the uh, uh, I can't remember the name of his formal organization. Excuse me, but I know that in Ghana, for example, when what ha what has happened in Ghana is that a lot of young men and some young women have basically been dragooned onto fishing boats uh, at age 9, 10, 11. And what, uh, what's saved, I, think it's, I think it's called Save the Slaves, uh, Kevin Bell's group. What they've done basically is they work with microfinancing groups in these villages basically to create uh, a, uh, to, to basically make it unaffordable or not to make it attractive for parents. Because quite often, quite often, whether it be uh, parts of Ghana or whether it be India uh, or Sri Lanka, it's parents cooperating with traffickers almost sometimes turning uh, the other cheek to pretend they're not, they don't know what's going to happen to their children. The uh, exigencies of, of poverty, again, push people to do things that we can imagine doing, including placing our own children in slavery. Uh, and what's happening in Ghana is that this has become very unattractive for, um, uh, it's no longer attractive for these, uh, for these parents. It's no longer an incentive because they, uh, uh, money is flowing through some of these villages. It's obviously not a lot of money, but it allows them basically to carry on a living uh, and not attempt it to put their children in harm's way. Is there uh, another question? I wish we had all the time in the world, and you have to forgive me for, uh, for the mechanical problems initially, and let me just end with this, if you will. I think that it is certainly the case that there is more human trafficking, forced labor, child sexual exploitation happening in the United States than we have documented. The important thing for people to understand is that human trafficking and slavery touch our lives in ways we don't necessarily understand. It is inevitably involved and often involved in producing products that we consume each and every day, from laptops to shirts to salt and rice. So we can't ignore it. And what I would suggest, again, in terms of uh, uh, steps, uh, include passing stronger state and federal laws, this according to various individuals, reauthorize something called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act here in the United States, make it more difficult for Americans to go overseas and solicit prostitutes. Uh, that's uh, sex tourism. I know it sounds like a major infringement on civil liberties. But it also is, and it, it, it's engaging quite often in uh, this is supply and demand, and that supply and demand factor basically fuels human trafficking. Uh, and to pass comprehensive immigration reform, uh, individuals coming from Mexico or uh, Haiti or any other place will always be exploited in this country uh, and other countries uh, if, uh, if, in fact, the conditions that, uh, exist that allow for that exploitation to occur. And you can read the rest. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. This is a gift from the Fletcher community to you. Oh. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you everyone for coming and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.